Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for being here today. We've got an exciting uh, program, and we're looking forward to it. I particularly like college presidents and deans who bring in diverse speakers, and President Bollinger does that, and I admire him for doing it. To, uh, to introduce our speaker today, and let me remind you, please turn your cell phones, and everybody knows that that's my rule, but uh, if, I, if I forget it, then the cell phone goes off. To uh, introduce our uh, program today is uh, Marie Lindquist, who is Director of Field Service Education here at the Clinton School. Uh, Marie has the primary responsibility for organizing and supervising our seven practicum group projects all over Arkansas. And under her responsibility, our students are at various sites uh, performing public service work uh, this semester and, and next semester, and to monitor those and, and, and coordinate that is a, is, a, is a major activity, and she's doing great work. Uh, we recruited her this year. Uh, this is her first year at the Clinton School. She came from uh, uh, Rhodes College in Memphis, where she was the Associate Dean of Students. Uh, and so we're, we're very glad that she's here. Uh, and she's doing a great job. So would you please welcome Marie Lindquist. This was a fun one for me to introduce because of my background in higher education. The most challenging debates occur when core values conflict with one another. For example, most colleges and universities are determining that the inclusion of diverse perspectives is of significant value to an educational environment. That value, however, conflicts with other prominent values. For example, the value of free speech can hinder the creation of a welcoming environment that allows diverse perspectives to be voiced, which has spurned the creation of speech codes on campuses. These conflicts and core values are often the focus of Lee Bollinger's work as a scholar, lawyer, and college president. First as president at the University of Michigan, he was a defendant in two Supreme Court affirmative action cases. He argued for the ability to use racial diversity as a factor in the university's admissions processes. Then, as the 19th president of Columbia University, President Bollinger upheld freedom of speech by allowing the controversial Iranian president Ahmadinejad to give a public lecture. These controversial conflicts of values seem to follow this First Amendment legal scholar who has become affectionately known as Prez Bo by his students. Of course, that is, this is not all of his work as a college president. In his current position, President Bollinger has also significantly expanded the resources of Columbia University, worked towards creating a more global college experience for Columbia students, and supported increasing the role of the arts. It is clear that Lee Bollinger is accomplished. More importantly, however, is his ability to articulate the complicated nature of the debates on values and his bold moves that push the limits of these conflicts in the higher education environment where these debates should be welcomed. I see this as extremely important work, especially for leaders in higher education. As an individual that has so far dedicated her own career to higher education, I'm honored to introduce a leader like Lee Bollinger to you today. Thank you very much. I uh, am really glad to be here. It's uh, not an easy flight from New York City in the morning. Uh, but uh, everything went well, and, uh, and I'm here and delighted. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank you, Dean, Skip, and um, uh, also uh, say how pleased I am to be here with uh, Jim Polshek in the audience. And Jim is, a, of course, a former dean of the School of Architecture and Urban Planning at, uh, at Columbia, a friend, and also uh, a client, uh, because I uh, hired his firm to uh, build a major building at the University of Michigan, 
and uh, we've also engaged him at, uh, at Columbia. So I'm eager to, to see the library uh, here, which of course is one of his uh, principal buildings and uh, one of the most famous buildings done in the, in the past several years. Um, I know that um, there is a, a time for questions and I want to uh, make sure that you know I'm open to any talking about anything uh, that uh, you would like. Uh, I, I seem to have a knack for free speech controversies. Um, that's my field, free speech, free press. Uh, they seem to, uh, to just sort of uh, flock to me. I'm glad to talk about any of those, uh, including the visit by Ahmadinejad, which was just mentioned. Um, I'm also happy to, uh, to talk about other issues in higher education or more broadly. Uh, but today I would uh, like to spend my 20 minutes or so that I have uh, speaking about a book um, project that I have underway and that I expect will be published sometime in 2009, part of a series by Oxford University Press on various aspects of constitutional law. And mine is uh, freedom of the press. And I've decided to uh, use it as an occasion to think back over the time that I have been working on freedom of the press um, in the second half of the 20th century, but to think about what, where we have come from in developing the press and the concept of freedom of the press, to offer an analysis of that, uh, and then to think about where we are today and what is happening to the press and what should happen then with freedom of the press and the press in this century. So I would like to just sort of uh, describe uh, this. I find myself more and more fascinated by this subject. And I think it's of immense importance to this country and to the world. Uh, and I'm trying to think about a framework uh, for uh, this, uh, this new century. Let's start with uh, where freedom of the press and the press has come from. One of the things that people find uh, surprising is that the principle of freedom of the press is really, as we know it today, is really a product of the last century. It's a product of the 20th century. I have regularly taught, I'm teaching right now, an undergraduate course on freedom of the press. The cases that we begin with, the first Supreme Court cases, none before this, uh, were in 1919. There's no Supreme Court case on freedom of speech or of the press between the adoption of the Bill of Rights and the First Amendment in the late 18th century and 1919. All the cases that we think of, New York Times versus Sullivan, Pentagon Papers, Brandsburg versus Hayes, the refusal to give a right of uh, a privilege to the re reporters not to testify about confidential sources. All of these great cases come in the 20th century. And I will summarize them for you by saying that the court reached three momentous decisions with respect to freedom of the press in the 20th century. The first choice was to extend protection for speech and press further than any other country has done ever or has done to this point. If you say something false about someone's reputation, uh, about them, and it injures their reputation. You can't be sued for damages unless that person can show that you made that false statement knowingly or in reckless disregard of the truth. Britain, we think of as a very liberal democratic society. You can recover damages very easily for a false statement of fact about you, but not in this country. New York Times versus Sullivan said, we want a robust, uninhibited, wide open society when it comes to speech. 
And in order to have that, we're not going to let anybody sue you for damages, for injury to your reputation, unless you can show it was knowingly made. And that's actually extremely difficult to show, and therefore almost everything is sayable. What if you're a reporter or an editor, and there's a government employee who improperly, even criminally, takes documents that are classified, top secret, from the government and says they're prepared to hand them over to you, the press, with the hopes that you will publish them? You can take those documents, even though they are properly designated top secret, from this person who has criminally taken them from the government. And you can take them, and you can publish them, and the government cannot prosecute you. This is an amazing statement about the degree to which we have freedom of the press in this country. One can disagree with that, of course, but that's one major choice. And it extends to free speech, so it's the case that neo-Nazis can speak in this country, Ahmadinejad can speak in this country, people can advocate genocide, they can deny the Holocaust, they can advocate racism. We have, over the last century, created an environment that is truly uninhibited, robust, and wide open. The second major choice that was made in the Supreme Court was, we will not give you a right of access and recognize it by the Constitution. When the Bush administration decided to go to war in Afghanistan following September 11th, the administration decided that having the press along was not a great idea. If the press had sued, in federal court for a constitutional right to be present as this country went to war in Afghanistan. Under Supreme Court precedents, the court would have said no First Amendment right of access. Even though there's a very logical argument that in order to be able to report on the news, we have to be there to gather the news to do it effectively by a very narrow margin, five to four in many cases, over time the Supreme Court said, we're just not gonna go there. The third major choice that was made by the Supreme Court was what to do about public regulation passed by legislatures or by the federal government to regulate the press, to require it to cover certain issues and when it covers those issues to do so fairly, to represent different points of view, to allow citizens to have access to the press to express their point of view. The Supreme Court, in a series of cases, made a momentous decision of saying, first, you can do that with respect to broadcasting, television and radio. And they upheld the Fairness Doctrine, and they upheld public access rules, and then said you can't do that at all to the print media, newspapers. And we've had, therefore, a system, which I've called a dual system of freedom of the press, with very different constitutional rules with respect to broadcast media and print media. These are the three major choices that were made in the 20th century. I think they made a lot of sense, although I would have gone a different route on the right of access. And I would have said there is, should be a right of the press to go and cover the war in Afghanistan if the government says you can't go along. But the other parts I basically agree with and very complicated uh, analyses that are required to explore that and I won't go into them today. The next question is, okay, this is the press we created. These are the principles by which we will have that press. And by the way, the press developed to a very powerful and very major role in American society during that period of time. And it did so in part by encouragement of the Supreme Court calling the press the fourth branch of government, 
an institutional role in the society that was akin to the role of the courts itself or the Congress or the executive, we have built up an identity of the press in America that says it has a special role to play in our society. At the same time, the press became highly quasi-monopolistic. Early in the 20th century, there were many newspapers per city. By the end of the century, of the 1,600 daily newspapers in the United States, well over 90% of them were natural monopolies in many cities, the only newspaper in town. When I grew up, my father ran a small town newspaper in Baker, Baker Oregon, and it was the only daily newspaper in Baker, Oregon. That was true in cities throughout the country. How has the world changed? The world is changing in dramatic ways. I mean, we're seeing, of course, fundamental changes in the economic system daily now. But there are fundamental changes going on in the ways in which we speak, communicate, c cover public issues. What are these changes? What's causing them? Well, I, I think there are three, two I'll talk about quickly, but they're important. One is the rise of the internet. And the internet is having this fabulous effect of making it possible to have true public access. Just 10 years ago, if you wanted to set up something to compete with the New York Times, you couldn't really do it. Today, you can. You can set up a website, and it goes out to, to people just like the New York Times website goes out to people. If you do better, people will come, and they'll read what you have to say, rather than the New York Times or the Washington Post. By the way, I should say I sit on the board of the Washington Post Company, so I just make that as a sort of full disclosure. Um, it's also having an eroding effect on the finances of the press. So every single quarter, we are getting reports that the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Tribune Company, McClatchy Newspapers, Gannett, their revenues are falling by very large amounts of, of uh, large amounts, 5, 10, 15 percent. It's basically a business at the moment that is losing about 5 percent on average of its audience a year. Uh, it is unclear what the implications of this are for the press as we've known it. Traditional media are setting up their websites. They're trying to shift their press delivery system to the internet. But the revenues are not coming back anything close to what they have had before. One of the effects of this is a downsizing that is happening. Newsrooms are being cut from 800 to 6, 700 to 600, as in the case of the Washington Post. This is a big effect. The second major force that is going on in the world today that's affecting newspapers is globalization. We're all becoming much more interconnected around the world than has ever been true before. And that's partly a product of communications technologies, but it's also a product of the rise of capitalism as a method of organizing our societies. If you think of where we are today in the financial crisis, part of that comes from a bubble that we all know existed in the housing market. It was fed in part by easy money that would come from countries like China buying our treasury bills and making available uh, money at lower interest rates. It's a complicated thing, but it's Globalization is the big thing. The irony here is the following. The internet, which is expanding the reach of our media to, to go to the world and our own citizens, is also being undermined by that technology financially. And the consequences of that 
include the press cutting back on foreign coverage. There have been many studies done very recently of what's happening in our traditional media with respect to cover, coverage of foreign news, and it's declining rapidly. There is a movement in the business model of our press to become increasingly local because that's what distinguishes the press. So at the very moment that we have a more integrated society, global society, we have a press that's covering it less and less because of the financial conditions. This is a great, great irony. There's another major change that's going on, which I'm not going to talk about, but it's basically, I think, a rise of knowledge in the 20th century. Human beings created more knowledge, more expertise than ever before. And that gives the press a role of being a very significant moderator or public forum in which that expertise is integrated. How many of you learn what you know about new research in architecture or in neurology? neurology and neuroscience from the press because they're covering it. Question is, what do we do this century? What do we need to think about? I think there are many things that we need to consider, and I'm in the process of, of trying to explore these now. If you believe, as I do, that the press is really important, that the court and others were right in the 20th century, that we need a press as a means of, of critiquing the government, of exposing problems, of highlighting issues, of being a forum for talking about major issues of our time. If you believe that, and you believe further that it has to be an institution, it can't just be hundreds of thousands of bloggers that each of us sort of selects. It would be as if saying universities don't have to exist. If somebody wants to be a Socrates scholar, Aristotle scholar, they'll do that, and they'll put it up on the web and you can go find it. There's something different about a world in which information and ideas are available someplace and where they're collected and institutionally loved and respected and nurtured as happens in a university. And the same is true of the press. And if you believe, as I do, that the press should have a culture of professionalism, and if you believe, as I do, that the press ought to be out there covering the world, and we ought to think of ourselves as moving into a global society, then how do we respond to this in the face of a world in which we have these declining influence, uh, uh, declining revenues and, and changes in behavior, uh, and so on. Well, there are many things to, to say, and I'll just say, mention two or three and then stop. In a way, the problem today is how do we create the capacity of our press to deal with a, a global society that's going to take time. It's going to take time for that global society to emerge. And how do we deal with a world that is much less committed to free speech and free press than we are? In a way, we are reverting back two centuries. So last century, the Supreme Court of the United States and the courts used the Constitution to say, you can't have laws that forbid people and the press from criticizing government officials. The Supreme Court could do that. Well, today, that's the basic law of many, many countries throughout the, the, the world. And when our press is out there reporting on things to us and to the world, they run into these censorship laws. There are many examples, although they're not now part of our consciousness in a very uh, direct sort of way. Google puts up its websites from the United States. They're downloaded and seen all over the world. Well, that means that Turkey, which has a law against 
criticizing Turkishness may find it appropriate to bring a criminal action against Google in Turkey for what's launched out of the United States. Same is true in Italy. That Google's under indictment in various countries of the world, including Italy. Recently, there was a case involving someone who published a book out of the United States, and it was about funding terrorism, and it was downloaded in 23 copies on Amazon in Britain. One of the people criticized as a funder of terrorism from the Middle East brought suit for libel in a British court and claimed damages. The author didn't show up, but the judgment was entered. This is Britain. And now the question is, will that be enforceable in the United States? Recently a bill was passed saying it can't be enforceable, but that author better not go to Britain because you're going to be subject to that. So we're facing a problem as a society as we move into this global society. How do we get our press out there? And how do we change the world so that it's freer to do this sort of reporting that needs to be done? Getting the press out there is a big problem. There are only two major media who have regular bureaus in Iraq now, the New York Times and the Washington Post. That's pretty stunning because it's so expensive. The Chicago Tribune doesn't have an office or a bureau in, in, uh, in Iraq. Uh, we're about to send major forces of our young men and women into the tribal areas of Afghanistan and Pakistan. What do we know about what it's like there, about what will be entailed? Who are the reporters? Who are the press who are sending reporters there to help us understand this very important decision? Well, I think at the end of the day, we're going to have to draw on a number of levers, levers to try to begin to change this situation. And I think we're probably going to have to turn to some kind of public funding schemes to help the press to be out there in the world, setting up foreign bureaus, setting up networks and satellite uh, uh, networks uh, for broadcasting. Um, Britain has done this with the BBC. BBC World Service publishes in 150 countries, 42 languages. Um, my view is the United States should have the equivalent of BBC World Service out there in the world, reporting back on it to us and reporting to people in the world. But that's going to take a change in our funding, our public sector funding. BBC gets over $6 billion in revenues every year from a license fee. If you buy a TV, you have to pay that. In our country, PBS gets about $300 million. Maybe it's more than that. It's in that magnitude. We're also going to have to invoke things like international trade policy in order to try to get more opportunities for our press to have a presence uh, abroad. We're going to have to think about the ways in which we distribute uh, foreign aid and the conditions we attach to them. My point is not to do more than just sketch the kinds of responses that we're going to need, perhaps an international convention on censorship, like we've had an international convention on intellectual property. My general theme is we built up this extraordinary set of principles and practices in the United States in the 20th century to create a free press, to create a, a, a fourth branch of government as we saw it. It was a really great accomplishment, right up there with the creation of universities. It is really under threat at the moment because of new technologies that are great and a new commitment to globalization that is great, but it's undermining the capacity to continue this and it also requires more uh, than what we've had before. The problem is, how we address this 
is not going to be able to draw on the same kinds of levers that we were in the last century because there is no Supreme Court of the world. There's no place we can turn to help us figure this out. And therefore, we're going to have to try other mechanisms. Thank you very much for listening. some questions. If you raise your hand, we'll get a microphone to you. In the back. Jane. I think our framers um, intended that every freedom be balanced with responsibility. So the more robust the press becomes, what do you see as responsibilities? I'm not talking about strict reporting. I'm talking about punditry and the other things that have come into the press realm. Um, you're talking about what I couldn't hear the last part. You're talking about punditry? We seem, uh, through our 24-hour press now, not to have strict reporting, but a great deal of opinion and so on. Um, is there responsibility that comes with this increased freedom? Um, very good question. So, and there are many ways to, to try to approach it. In terms of what the principle of free speech and free press should be, um, as I said, the court took very different approaches. With respect to the print media, it said anything goes. You're, we think you have responsibilities, but they're not going to be enforceable by law. And we're going to have to live with a world in which those responsibilities are created and enforced through non-legal mechanisms. I'll talk about those in just a second. With respect to the broadcast media, television and radio, the court took a very different approach and said public regulation can be implemented a federal commission could be set up, the Federal Communications Commission, to make sure that the citizen's interest in responsible journalism is, is uh, realized. And it had this dual approach. Again, it's a really complicated analysis as to why the court said that was right, why what they said was right was completely wrong, why it was completely wrong doesn't answer the question whether the result was right. And I argued many, many, many years ago that it was the right result for the wrong reason. Um, with respect to how do we nurture a sense of responsibility, because after all, of course free speech and free press can only exist in a society in which there is a deep sense of responsibility about what you say. I mean, the idea that, there, that we don't care about what ideas are expressed is ridiculous. We care enormously, we should care enormously. But how do we nurture that if we can only use non-legal means? I think universities have played a key role. I think journalism schools are incredibly important. One of my beliefs has been that journalism education needs and scholarship needs to really change. And when I became president of Columbia, the, Columbia has the greatest school of journalism um, other than the University of Arkansas. And I don't know, does, does Arkansas have a journalism school? <laughs> um, and so we, I said, we really need to think about what a journalism school is in, the, in this century. And my view personally is that the press needs to have more expertise. Uh, a lot of people in the press and a lot of people, other people, think that's a terrible thing to talk about. Journalists should be generalists. The last thing you want are experts. Look at university professors. They're experts. Would you possibly want them? Reporting on the world, obviously not. My view is not all university professors as experts are as bad as you think. 
and we should want a lot of people with expertise. For example, reporters who understand the financial system. Um, I mean, I, I think we have to say most of our institutions have failed us in very significant ways just in the past decade. The press knows it failed the society with respect to the beginning of the Iraq War. Whether it was right to go into the war or not, that's not the issue. We were not informed about the decision to be reached at the time of going in. We know that there has been failure to anticipate the financial crisis we're in now. Um, we need people who understand things, and journalism schools should become more professional in the ways in which they approach this, and that means fundamentally a body of knowledge that every journalist should have. That's what law schools do, that's what architecture schools do, that's what medical schools do, and we should have that for journalism. And it should have a culture of professionalism, and this is a way of trying to nurture a sense of responsibility. So I'm just trying to respond very directly to your question about the link between freedom and responsibility and, and how the court has allowed public institutions to regulate in some ways and how we have to rely on other institutions to accomplish that. In front of our writing. Bob. In relationship to what you were talking about in the world, and there's no Supreme Court of the world, <clears throat> the world order right now is the United States supposedly being the uh, only superpower. In the globalization process, how do we achieve a means of actually talking to the world? And that including, should there be some mechanism requirement that global news that's not necessarily in good light of the United States be also required to be presented to the people here to give the United States citizens, who seem to be somewhat isolated sometimes from world view, being able to be seen and read how they are actually viewed in the rest of the world. Right, so I think that's a fundamental point, if I understand you correctly, that as we become more and more interconnected with the world, I mean, I've been to China um, I don't know, 10 times over the course of 30 years. Uh, I'm like everybody else. I go now. I can't believe what's happening. I mean, I just can't believe it. And then I ask myself, how much do I really, I'm a president of a major university, how much do I really know about China? It's embarrassing to me how little I know about China with respect to what I think should be a basic knowledge about that society as it is emerging into this new uh, role as a, um, uh, a great uh, power. The same is true of the Middle East. What, what do I, you know, ask yourself, what do you really know about this? So India, so we have a desperate need in this country for more information. And that means many things. It means our universities should be more engaged with the world than, than we are. We've got all kinds of plans at Columbia, and I know you do here, to try to think about how do we, in, how do we get out there and learn what we need to, to know. But it also means fundamental things about our press. And when I say something like, you know, when we invaded Afghanistan, the reports are there was basically no presence there of U.S. media. Um, very, very little presence. We had virtually no understanding of, of what was about to happen. Uh, when there are only two of our great press institutions who have a regular presence in Iraq, uh, these are very serious concerns, and we have to address that by by some kind of means of getting 
press out there on a regular basis so it can report back to us. That's, so I'm agreeing with, I think, with what you're saying. We need to get means of getting more information about the world. Joyce, you have a question? Right, right there. Thank you. It, it seems to me that uh, we have a general lack of appreciation for intellectual property, period, in our country. Um, and I think perhaps that leads to not respecting journalism as something that should be standardized. I, I taught school for many years and kids thought if it were on the internet, it was real knowledge. So would you comment on um, whether or not you think that is the case as well, that we don't really respect intellectual property, and if that is the case, those rights, and if that is the case, how that might uh, impact how we perceive standardized good journalism as opposed to something that's just on the net. Well, what is the link, though, uh, between the we don't respect intellectual property and, and the press here? I think, um, for example, the bloggers. Yeah. We tend to say, well, it was on the blog, so therefore it was, it's good journalism. I see. I think, like architecture, anything else, good journalism should meet some standard. Yeah. And people don't make that distinction, I think, many times. It's a blog, it's good standardized journalism. I right, think that right. So I, I think this is, a, this is a very serious issue. There are people, as I, as I sort of, you know, talk about what I'm talking about today, I encounter people who say the following, more or less. Look, who cares if the New York Times and the Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal go out of business? Who cares? You know, we've got thousands of people out there setting up their own websites and their little groups and they're, the, and they're looking at uh, the, the, the world um, and reporting to us on it. And these are uh, dinosaurs, and, and it's going to be replaced by a much more interesting and variegated kind of uh, world of, of the press. And I guess my view, I mean, I could be, you know, just uh, stuck in the past. I, I, my view is I love the fact that free speech has been so enriched by the opportunities for everybody to participate. But I think there's a still a very important place for institutions, call them the press in this case, who have a professional culture, which means that they understand that they cannot do everything, uh, either just for their own political purposes, their own ideological purposes, or for financial purposes. I mean, that's, that's fundamentally I, my background is law, as you know. It took a long time to create a sense of responsibility of professionalism in law that you have a role to play in the society. You have to make some money, you have to make a living. It's not as if you're not in a business. But you have a role to play in the society and you can't do everything you want to make money. The market cannot determine the way in which you behave entirely. And furthermore, you can't just do whatever you happen to think will achieve your political purposes. You have something beyond you, which we call professionalism. I think having a press as an institution with that kind of, of sense of purpose is vital in addition to having the anybody can set up a blog. And, uh, and, and that's what I'm trying to argue for and to figure out how we can nurture it in a new in a new world. We have time for one more question, Ron. Yes, I have basically uh, two questions. Number one, in light of the uh, freedom of speech, which you proclaimed, does Columbia have a speech code? And if uh, whether it does it, or not, would it you does speak? not have a speech code. Yeah. Uh, a number of universities do, and I assume you do not support that. And yeah. the second question is that it seems to me back around in the 50s or 40s, there was a change in philosophy of reporting from going to the facts to interpreting the facts. And there seems to be a real credibility among many people concerning the press. And I was wondering if you would comment on that. So on the second point, it's um, again, uh, right, there is a, you know, journalism schools are facing 
this problem. If you talk to Nick Lemon, who is our dean of the School of Journalism at Columbia, he will say, you know, we have a, we have a pretty hard task of convincing people to pay thirty, forty thousand dollars a year to come here and take courses for a career that may not exist in five years. Um, and we need to convince the world, as I just tried to do, that there is something different from just expressing your opinion about things to reporting on the world as objectively as you possibly can. And that's just another way of saying uh, that there is a, arguably, there is a difference and it's important that we have it. With respect to um, speech codes, I, I've been against speech codes. It's, um, it's a, a, again, a complicated matter because not all speech is protected. Uh, you have to start from a premise that public institutions are subject to the First Amendment and private institutions are not. So if the University of Arkansas said, uh, if the president of the University of Arkansas said, you know, I'm really tired of students criticizing me, uh, and I really like this concept that I've heard about called seditious libel, and that means if you embarrass the president or the government or you criticize the government, you know, you can be put in jail or you can be expelled from school. And I hereby promulgate a seditious libel law for the, for the University of Arkansas instantly declared unconstitutional because it's a state institution. If I at Columbia did it and students sued me and said this is our violation of our First Amendment rights, I'd say, sorry, First Amendment doesn't apply to Columbia and I would win because it's a private institution and the First Amendment doesn't reach private uh, action. Universities, private as well as public, have voluntarily said, we want to live by the First Amendment. And that's the way we should do it, and that's what, as I said, we have done. That doesn't mean that every single act of speech is protected. So if a student comes up to, or a student starts to threaten another student, um, threats are hard to define, but we know it when we see it, um, that's not protected by the First Amendment. If a student harasses uh, another uh, student, sexual harassment, uh, racial harassment, that's not protected by the First Amendment. On the other hand, if you give a speech and it's got racist elements to it and um, sexist elements, and, and, but it's a speech about um, uh, your feelings about race or sex or gender or anything, or, and you use that, that's protected. So typically the problem with speech codes is that they went from the first and bled into the second. And that's where we just shouldn't go. I really appreciate your listening. Thank you very thank much. Thank you very much.